applying um, the French laws. So this uh, went on for quite a little, uh, for quite some time. But of course, then uh, the law started evolving because, uh, of course, uh, those judges were having <clears throat> some difficulties in implementing uh, the French laws, especially uh, where it concerned uh, everything pertaining to procedure or to rules of evidence. And on the other hand, so uh, one of the main aims of the British in colonizing uh, the island was to, um, because it was because it was on the route of the East India Company. Okay, so uh, the main purpose of uh, colonizing the island was a commercial one, was a strategic commercial one, and therefore um, it was very difficult to impose on all. Uh, and those traders who were uh, coming to Mauritius to impose on them to go according to uh, the French laws. So gradually there was a, a shift okay, from uh, that application, from the strict application of the provisions of the Treaty of Capitulation. And finally, the Mauritian law evolved in such a way that it became a hybrid system of the law, whereby uh, nowadays most of the rules pertaining to uh, procedure, to evidence, to uh, financial services and company law would be uh, influenced by the common law, uh, by the common law uh, provisions. And uh, everything pertaining to uh, the civil law, that is the relationship between different persons, the private rights, if you want, would be uh, still very much of French inspiration. And together with that, the Mauritian law has evolved in such a manner that it has really become Mauritian now, okay, with uh, influences of both um, civil law and uh, the common law. Now, another uh, very interesting aspect of uh, the Mauritian legal system is also the fact that um, we are um, mostly uh, uh, we uh, mostly have some kind of dualist system. That is, whenever there would be um, treaties, for example, which have to be incorporated within uh, the domestic law. So it is not going to be uh, some kind of automatic incorporation, but uh, those different treaties have to be first voted upon in uh, our parliament to, be, uh, to become a part of the substantive law. Okay, and of course, Mauritius tries uh, its best in order to um, align itself with its international obligations. So, and another yet um, interesting aspect of um, the Mauritian legal system is that um, there are different types of courts. Okay, because this is going, uh, I will be uh, referring to those different um, uh, courts uh, during the presentation. So we have different hierarchies of courts. Um, I don't know if some of you have visited the island or not. Okay, so um, basically Mauritius is divided into nine different districts. And of course, we have uh, the island of Rodrigues as well, which is um, uh, attached to uh, Mauritius. So we have nine different districts. So uh, if ever there is some kind of uh, dispute or if ever there is some kind of misdemeanor or contravention which has happened, these would normally be uh, tackled upon um, at the level of district courts. Okay, And we also have some kind of uh, maximum penalty, maximum sum which can be claimed for damages, which would be judged upon by those courts. Um, then we can proceed further up where uh, there is the intermediate court, which has a higher jurisdiction than um, those district courts, the district courts which tend to be quite territorial in nature. And uh, finally, we have the Supreme Court. Now, there are two uh, different limbs in the Supreme Court, because when we refer to the Supreme Court of Mauritius, we refer firstly to the Supreme Court as a court having some kind of original jurisdiction, especially in constitutional law matters, okay, or uh, for those matters whereby an express provision is uh, made that these have to be judged upon by the Supreme Court. And when we refer to the Supreme Court, we also refer to the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. 
that is the Supreme Court, is also a court of appeal. Now, there are many um, debates going on about um, the organization of uh, the Supreme Court, and uh, many experts and academics have claimed that uh, there is now the need to separate um, the Supreme Court so that we do not have this kind of uh, situation where you have the same uh, bench of judges, and those judges might be hearing cases at the first instance, and uh, they will also be hearing cases at the second instance. So of course, it would not be the same judges, but a hierarchy uh, in the hierarchy, they would uh, be uh, the same. Um, and finally, the last court of appeal um, in uh, Mauritius, as it has written in a certain way, uh, this as a colonial vestige, is uh, the uh, Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. Okay, so uh, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council is therefore the last court of appeal um, in Mauritius. The, uh, Mauritius. Um, <clears throat> The IP legislation in Mauritius, uh, historically, it dates back to the 19th century. So uh, there were initial industrial property statutes, and those initial property statutes were the Patent Acts, which was enacted as far back as 1875, and the Trademarks Act, which was um, enacted in um, 1868. Copyright was first protected by the Copyright Act of 1986, okay, and uh, of course, now as a consequence of its membership of the World Trade Organization, Mauritius has been, uh, to a certain extent, obliged to comply with the TRIPS agreement, which came into effect in 1995. So, um, as you can see, uh, the um, intellectual property legislation in Mauritius was quite um, sparse um, before, um, before 1995. So once the TRIPS agreement came into effect, this, uh, in a certain way, kept uh, set the pace running for Mauritius to, um, to um, update and to be in line with its um, international obligations. Therefore, okay, um, that uh, copyright of 1986 was then amended by a Copyright Act of 1997, which was then further amended by a Copyright Act of 2014. And after... Um, and the, uh, the TRIPS agreement, there were many um, laws concerning industrial property which were then uh, promulgated in Mauritius, which were enacted in Mauritius. So, um, amongst those acts, we have the Patent Industrial Designs and Trademarks Act of 2002, the Protection Against Unfair Practices Act, Industrial Property Act, of 2002, the layout designs, topographies of integrated circuits act of 2002, and the geographical indications act of 2002. There was also, um, during this same period, there was a plant breeders right of um, act of 2000. The 2002, which was also enacted, but um, the interesting and the regrettable um, um, aspect of all those laws was that there were some of these acts which were never promulgated. Okay, so um, usually um, the acts um, uh, and they were not promulgated, and therefore they were just acts which existed, but they could not be enforced because they were not promulgated, because this is how um, the uh, lawmaking process is in Mauritius, that is, you should have the act, it should be pro proclaimed, and it should also be promulgated. Um, <clears throat> Then um, <clears throat> there was, um, during the past um, 
seven, eight years, there was a renewed um, interest in um, the protection of industrial property rights. And this was in line with the government's vision to make Mauritius some kind of intellectual property hub within the African region. So um, the government therefore enacted the Copyrights Act of 2014. So the Copyrights Act of 2014 is a clear-cut departure from its predecessor because it is an act which um, tended to uh, be more modern in its outlook and to try to remedy to the different um, technological advances which were um, taking place. And finally, um, this is one of the most important, um, if not the most important um, um, amendment or change which has been brought in the industry, in the intellectual property rights landscape in Mauritius. And it is the Industrial Property Act of 2019. Okay, but this act has not yet been promulgated. So, um, in a certain way, this is going to be uh, the situation that is the main acts which would govern uh, the different intellectual property rights, the different intellectual property rights uh, regime in Mauritius. Um, <clears throat> so, um, further modifications of the Mauritian uh, intellectual property legislation were proposed so that the domestic laws would be in line with the agreements that Mauritius is a party to. And this is in line with the different timeframes as well, which have been imposed by the TRIPS agreement. And um, so um, the newest acts, therefore, as I have um, told you, would be the Copyright Act of 2014. And this Copyright Act uh, it should, be, uh, should be noted as well, has been considerably amended by uh, the Copyrights Act Amendment, uh, by the Copyrights Amendment Act of 2017. Then, um, Okay, so, um, voilà. Anna, uh, now we are just going, I'm just going to um, guide you through uh, the different uh, legislations which we have. So, uh, as some kind of preamble. Okay, so uh, Mauritius follows, uh, therefore, the common law system concerning uh, intellectual property rights, and uh, it is also deeply attached to uh, the French. Uh, conception of intellectual property rights. That is, the French um, have that tendency of uh, protecting copyright, which they call the droit d'auteur. And um, this is a, a, a rational, this is a concept which is very much protected in Mauritius as well. So, um, and uh, it is also worth noting that of all the intellectual property rights, copyright and uh, trademarks would be those uh, intellectual property rights which are which have a very important place in Mauritius because um, there are many artists in Mauritius there are many uh, people who try to create uh, things, especially concerning handicrafts, concerning paintings and all. And so the Copyrights Act uh, tries to cater for those different uh, people and for those different creators. And it has instilled quite a unique regi a regime uh, protection for um, those creators. Mauritius um, also um, has seen quite a huge industrial development. And as a result of this industrial development and the shifting in the consumption habits of uh, the Mauritian uh, population as well. Trademarks have come to play quite an important role in the intellectual property uh, picture framework of the island. Okay, so uh, concerning patents, we do not have uh, many patents which are registered and um, the same apply to designs, to utility models and um, 
to integrated circuits and all, but these uh, are also very much uh, protected in Mauritius, even if in Mauritius we do not have many people making an application as such for uh, those different intellectual property rights, those different industrial property rights. Um, on the other hand, one of uh, a very, uh, there is a new uh, tendency, there is a new awareness on the part uh, of the Mauritian population to try to protect everything concerning geographical indications. Okay, so I'm going to devote a little part of the presentation on uh, geographical indications as well. So uh, for the moment, let us just uh, see what is, uh, in a certain way, the, um, the protection which is going to be offered to works of a copyright in Mauritius. Therefore, uh, Mauritius has evolved very much in its copyright laws since its independence in 1968. And in the last International Property Rights Index uh, report in, in 2016, Mauritius was ranked 40th in the world and second in the African region behind South Africa in terms of copyright protection. It also has a 4.5 score for copyright protection and an intellectual property rights score of um, 5.1, okay, and this has uh, also increased very little since 2007. So, um, as I was telling you, um, <clears throat> the uh, the latest uh, change in uh, copyright uh, protection in Mauritius was brought about in 2014 and amended in 2017. And prior to that, it was the Copyrights Act of 1997. Okay, so the main uh, rationale, the main aim behind uh, the amendment, the really substantial amendment of copyright laws was spelled out as uh, presenting the Copyright Act of 2014 as an act to make better provision for the protection of intellectual property and for connected matters. Okay, And uh, it was also an act which was designed to provide for legislations concerning new technologies and computer software. Now, the fundamental target of that new act was to render the Mauritian copyright law in line with the WIPO Copyright Treaty and the WIPO Performances and Phonogram, Phonogram Treaty. So the act in all contains uh, approximately 60 sections, which are divided into 10 different parts. And it is all with a view to provide for more effective protection of copyright and related rights. Okay, And uh, the main aim of the act was to be in line with uh, the major technological transformation that the world has witnessed. The act was also introduced to provide better protection and also to secure the rights of artists, creators and performers which expect to earn a living through their, ta their talent and creativity and and uh, they are most often deprived of this due to intellectual property pirates. Okay, so um, the Copyrights Act in Mauritius, of course, like uh, those of other jurisdictions, protect every kind of artistic and literary work. Okay, it also provides for derivative work, for secondary work, for the protection. Um, uh, it also provides for uh, licensing and assignment of those rights. And all this is very uh, strictly regulated in the sense that uh, the economic rights are recognized. Okay, and those economic rights are protected along with uh, international obligations during the lifetime of the author and uh, following 70 years after um, the death of the author or of the copyright owner. So the Mauritian legislation also clearly makes the distinction between um, the author as the creator of the work 
and uh, also uh, distinguishes between the author of the work and the copyright owner in case there is some kind of, of assignment or licensing of the copyright. And um, it also makes uh, provision for um, what will happen if ever there would be works which would be commissioned by one person or when there would be works which would be created by the employee and who is going to be eventually the copyright owner. So, um, so all these uh, matters, all these specific matters are very important uh, components of the Copyrights Act um, in Mauritius, especially because now uh, Mauritius is more and more opening itself internationally. So there would be many um, other uh, parties which would be coming in and uh, employing uh, many uh, Mauritian employees as well. So very often um, these uh, copyright agreements, especially in um, contracts of employment, are um, gaining more and more importance. Then um, another um, important um, contribution of uh, the uh, copyright uh, 2014 would be towards the protection of folklore and traditional cultural expressions. And both of these are clearly defined in the interpretation section of the act. So on the one hand, folk folklore would include folk tales, poetry, songs, instrumental music, and dancers. I don't uh, know if you have ever witnessed, um, for example, in Mauritius, we have a very particular um, kind of, of dance, which is known as the Sega dance. We even have um, concerns. Uh, Hindu weddings, there is the Geet Kawai, which has been uh, now recognized as part of the UNESCO cultural heritage. Okay, so prior to the Copyright Act of 2014, these would not be protected. And now these are protected by the Copyright Act. And uh, on the other hand, it would also include um, the protection of folklore would also uh, include the traditional cultural expressions, which would mean any form of artistic and literary expression, which is going to be intergenerational, including verbal and tangible expressions. And this is because uh, in Mauritius, we also have many um, dialects. For example, uh, native Mauritians, the official language in Mauritius is English. Many people, uh, the majority of the population, can also speak French, but uh, there are also uh, many um, very specific dialects in Mauritius. For example, the Mauritian Creole, the Mauritian Creole, which is really a mixture of uh, French, okay, and uh, maybe English, and it has really become quite Mauritian in its nature. So uh, this, uh, these languages, these dialects are quite colorful in themselves, and therefore these can also be protected now, which was not the case uh, a long ago. For example, many people also um, speak Bhojpuri, which is quite different from uh, another type of Bhojpuri, for example, which is being spoken in an other area of the world. So there are uh, many specificities of uh, the Mauritian folklore, of the Mauritian way of life, which in a certain way the Copyright Act of 2014 has tried to protect. Now, um, further to this, to be in line uh, with uh, the other technological uh, development, um, the Copyright Act of 2014 has also introduced anti-circumvention and technological protection measures, okay, which is something which is quite um, interesting and which did not exist under the prior act. For example, it uh, provides an extensive list of prohibited activities, okay, and um, why uh, and uh, the legislator has also uh, tried 
to um, define as far as possible what would be the prohibited acts so that um, uh, there would be no doubts in the interpretation of such terms in law at the trial of an offender. Now, both uh, those anti-circumvention and technological protection measures are also provided for in the WIPO Copyright Treaty. So basically, this Copyright Act of 2014 has tried to place Mauritius as far as possible in line with uh, what should be protected according to its international obligations. Now, um, there is also uh, there would also be provisions concerning right, right management information, because uh, with the advancement in technology, infringe, infringement of rights of copyright owners, and the disguise of such infringements have become much more easier. Therefore, um, for example, the new act provides that no person shall remove or alter any electronic rights management information without the consent of its owner. Therefore, it's, um, every work has a certain amount of information which is attached to it pertaining to the use of the work, and it is an offense now to remove or modify such information or to use such work whose electronic copyright information has been removed or altered, and it is also a way for the legislator to prevent unauthorized users from having access, unwanted access to secured information, and also to prevent unauthorized alteration of the information. And this is also in line with uh, all the different data protection um, measures which Mauritius seeks to enforce. Finally, one of the main uh, contributions of the Copyright Act 2014 concerns the uh, provisions pertaining to visually impaired persons, because um, prior to that act, nothing um, was there to try to protect or to try to facilitate in a certain way with the access of certain works to visually impaired persons. So now with uh, the Copyrights Act uh, 2014, visually um, impaired people are catered for, and for example, the reproduction of a work in an alternative form, such as a braille, for persons who are blind without the consent or authorization of the owner of the work of the work. But there are two essential conditions which should be satisfied in order to reproduce such a work. And those conditions would be that of course the work should not be reasonably available in an identical or largely equivalent form, enabling its perception by these persons or uh, that the reproduction of the work or the distribution should be made on a non-profit basis. So uh, this would be, in a certain way, the main, really the main um, changes which have been brought about by the Copyrights Act 2014. Now, the Act, as I told you, um, recognizes both the economic rights and the moral rights. Concerning the moral rights, the law, uh, in a certain way, goes back to its uh, French influences in the sense that those moral rights are considered as being indefinite in duration. That is, uh, there is no time bar concerning the recognition of the moral rights, but of course, um, the problem concerning the moral rights would be more uh, towards the enforcement of those rights. Because if uh, someone um, is not here to enforce his rights and those moral rights, since they are by their very nature um, in, intransmissible or that they cannot be transferred by will uh, to another person, the main problem concerning the moral rights would vest in how they are going to be um, enforced. Okay, So this would be, in a certain way, the main um, 
the main uh, aspects of uh, the copyright uh, protection in um, Mauritius. Now, um, Mauritius does face um, certain difficulties concerning the protection of copyright, because um, in Mauritius, um, copyright is considered as some form of property right. And as I was telling you concerning the specificities, of uh, the Mauritian um, legislation. So um, the right to property in Mauritius is mostly um, influenced by the civil law, uh, uh, the civil law conception, the civil law um, um, theory of uh, property right. Okay, so um, this is how copyright is, uh, in a certain way, viewed in Mauritius and even intellectual property rights. They are viewed as some kind of property right, and proper property right, the right to property, is in a certain way a civil law concept. So um, these uh, property rights would be strictly private rights, but the interesting thing about um, the institutional framework for the protection of copyright is that even if they are private rights, the help of public authorities can be enlisted whenever there is some kind of breach of copyright. I'm going to give you an example. For uh, uh, if ever there is a suspected so um, copyright infringement, in Mauritius as well, is viewed um, in two different manners. You can have the primary infringement, that is where someone is doing one of the prohibited acts towards copyright, for example, making unauthorized copies of the, uh, of the, of the work. And there can also be um, a kind of secondary infringement. Secondary infringement, for example, if uh, you're making an unauthorized copy of the work and someone else is selling those unauthorized copies, these would be uh, some kind of secondary infringement. So whenever um, there is that secondary infringement of copyright, very often um, we can have recourse to the help of public authorities. For example, you have this anti-piracy unit of the police, which was set up in 2001. So you can have the police intervening to protect the property right of someone. Usually in Mauritius, this is this does not happen. Okay, if it is strictly some kind of private right concerning uh, property, then the police is not going to intervene unless, of course, there is some kind of violence, unless there is some kind of degradation to property, which is going to disrupt the public order. But otherwise, the police is not going to intervene. But yet, in um, the protection of copyright, you have this anti-piracy unit of the police force, which is going to intervene. Now, um, how is it going to intervene? You see that I have also told you that there is the MASA. The MASA is the Mauritius Society of Authors. So the MASA was, uh, had been established in the first uh, Copyrights Act of 1997, okay, but there were many, uh, it was quite dysfunctional. And therefore, when uh, the act, when the law was amended in 2014, the MASA was wiped out and uh, it was replaced by a rights management society. The MASA is basically some kind of collecting society which is going to represent the interest of its members and its members would mostly be um, artists okay, who are going to pay some kind of nominal fees to the MASA in order for it to collect their royalties and to represent their interest. So this uh, MASA, Mauritius um, Society of Authors, was replaced by the Rights Management Society. And then, as I was telling you, there was that new, uh, there was that amendment, major amendment, which was brought in the Copyrights Act in 2017. So the uh, Rights Management Society was once more replaced by the MASA. 
So uh, the main mandate of the Maza is to look after the interest of its members, which would be copyright owners and exclusive licenses. Okay, so uh, usually piracy unit of the Mauritius uh, police force is going to work in close collaboration with the Maza as well as the industrial property officer. We will come to um, the organization of the industrial property office in a short while. Okay, so usually that anti-piracy unit is mandated to investigate copyright piracy on the local market and it usually um, does uh, carry out these functions by carrying out raids throughout the island to seize any kind of pirated copies. So, um, as you can see, uh, it seems to be something uh, which is very quite interesting. But there is a very um, fundamental difficulty, a very fundamental loophole in the uh, functioning of that anti-piracy unit in that it is very largely understaffed. Okay, so um, at one point in time, some five years back, for example, the uh, anti-piracy unit had only 13 members for a population of about 1.3 million. As you can see, this uh, lacune okay, uh, can pose uh, some kind of a uh, of fundamental threat to the effective enforcement of um, copyright protection because uh, it would not be possible to seize uh, all those uh, pirate copies or even we are going to see afterwards that the anti-piracy unit can also intervene in cases of trademark infringement. So it is very uh, less effective in uh, when we consider all the different kinds of infringement which are soaring up on the island. So this is, uh, this um, would be about the institutional framework for the protection of copyright. Of course, um, there is, um, the police also helps uh, in the enforcement of um, copyright, for example, if ever there is some kind of, for example, if, uh, they go about uh, and they can seize, uh, for example, the feed goods and the person says or gives an indication about where he got, for example, the pirate copies from. The, there is also the possibility for uh, the original uh, copyright owner to ask for some kind of delivery up of uh, the incriminating materials or there is also that possibility for the copyright owner to ask for some kind of search warrant on the premises of the one who is presumed to be um, to be uh, conducting that um, copyright infringement. So you can see that this is a private right. Uh, copyright, but there is still the help of the public authorities in order to try to uh, dismantle any kind of uh, organized uh, copyright infringement uh, scheme. Now, uh, of course, uh, concerning the protection of copyright, you also have um, the the court system, which is quite effective because the Copyright uh, Act in itself provides for various remedies in case of uh, copyright infringement. And uh, there would be different kinds of civil remedies, like, for example, delivery of uh, the uh, award of damages. Sometimes there can even be the award of additional damages. Okay, and uh, but uh, the court is also mindful of any um, of trying to balance the rights of the copyright owner with those of society, with those of uh, society at large. So the Copyright Act does provide for certain kinds of uh, permitted acts for the purposes of education, archives, etc. And uh, it also tries in a certain way to put a stop on uh, 
and over zealousness of copyright owners by having uh, provisions relating to vain threats. Okay, so this would be um, the main um, institutional framework uh, for the protection of copyright in Mauritius. Um, I hope that this was clear to you. Of course, I couldn't go into all the details. This was simply an overview. So if ever you have any questions, uh, we can take the questions afterwards. Um, now, um, as I was telling you in Mauritius, we have that tendency uh, really of separating Copyrights Act, uh, the copyright board, from the industrial uh, property rights uh, part concerning industry and intellectual property rights. So um, I am going to take you a little bit um, back in time. Okay, so as you can see, after the TRIPS agreement, there were many laws which had been enacted to protect those different um, industrial property acts. Okay, so, um, and these were uh, really in different legislations, and all those different legislations had, in a certain way, different regimes. And as I was telling you before that, there were some of the acts which were not even promulgated. That is, there was the structure, there was... Um, there was the provisions, but yet these could not be enforced because the act, for some reason or another, were not promulgated. And uh, having uh, those different legislation, if you uh, legislations in a piecemeal manner or in different compartments as well, was causing quite some kind of uh, misunderstanding. Was also causing quite uh, some kind of confusion amongst uh, many uh, users of uh, intel of industrial property. Okay, and uh, since uh, the past uh, decade, maybe um, every government which has been elected has as its vision the um, the fact of putting Mauritius forward as some kind of intellectual property hub, because Mauritius is a member of the, especially in the African region, Mauritius is a member of the SADC, it is also a member of the ARIPO, which is the African Regional Intellectual Property Organization, and therefore there has been this vision of putting Mauritius forward as some kind of international um, intellectual property hub, and therefore it was necessary to harmonize all the laws pertaining to industrial property in order to attract more investors and also to update all the laws as well. Okay, so this was, in a certain way, the um, rationale behind the Industrial Property Act of 2019. Please be mindful that this act as well has not yet been promulgated, but contrary to the other acts concerning, for example, plant breeders' rights or geographical indications, which were simply there but not promulgated and nothing was done about them, there have been many uh, fundamental structural institutional changes following the uh, enactment of the Industrial Property Act. Many institutions have started to change and there are things which are really moving concerning um, following the Industrial Property Act of 2019. So, um, in a certain way, you know, <clears throat> the IPA, okay, I'm going to refer to the Industrial Property Act as the IPA. The IPA 2019 has reinvented uh, the Mauritian's uh, industrial property rights protection realm. There were many changes which were brought concerning the administrative aspect and uh, whereby there are um, all the industrial, all the industrial property protection, protected rights in Mauritius, as well as the major related international treaties governing them, were all incorporated in one single 
um, framework. And then there were more, um, if you want, um, the act reinforced its protection with new innovative protective bodies. So, um, in a certain way, the main aspects of the act um, concern a new industrial property office, which uh, would have uh, new duties, for example, by maintaining up-to-date uh, up databases, undertaking, assisting in conducting research on industrial property. It should be uh, uh, it is very interesting to note that uh, even if there was the plant breeders' right, and even if uh, Mauritius was is quite uh, was quite active in the production production of sugarcane and new varieties of sugarcane, even this plant breeders' right was not uh, at that point in time uh, promulgated. Okay, so uh, the uh, Industrial Property Act aims to change all this and uh, also plans uh, to implement and assist in the preparation of educational and sensitization programs. This is another area which is quite lacking in Mauritius because we have many, uh, at one point in time, we had many small and medium enterprises. And these SMEs were not even aware that, uh, for example, they could protect their trademarks. There are still in Mauritius many people who are going to operate a business and who are going to have an unregistered trademark. It is very common in Mauritius to have many businesses operating and not registering their trademarks. And some of these trademarks are even quite well-known ones. So in this situation, um, it becomes quite interesting because trademarks, of course, are protected in Mauritius. They're protected for uh, most of, in the first uh, instance for a period of 10 years. And these would be renewable upon the payment of uh, the prescribed fees each year. And they can be uh, renewed, of course, for an indefinite period of time. But we also have many people who... Uh, operate a business and who have an unregistered trademark. Now, this unregistered trademark, of course, does not benefit from the same kind of protection as the registered trademark. And usually, these um, unregistered trademark would be protected under the civil code and more particularly by a uh, misrepresentation or by the thought of passing off. But of course, this is going to be different in the sense that this would be governed by the civil good and therefore by the French aspect of, uh, of our laws. Um, the IPA, therefore, the Industrial Prote uh, Property Act, also uh, is very instrumental in defining strategies, programs and action plans in line with regional and international best practices, and also in ensuring a proper coordination, both on the national and international sphere, among various agencies which would be dealing with um, intellectual property matters. So there are also some additional features of this Act, which um, did not exist under the previous Acts, Okay, and these would be, for example, the establishment of an intellectual property council. Now, that intellectual property council uh, has as its objective to be some kind of independent institution whereby there would be representatives from different spheres, from different uh, public and private sector and which would be um, very um, regularly involved in the elaboration of intellectual property policies. Um, the uh, Industrial Property Act also would um, cater for those employees who would create patented inventions under an employment contract so as to enable those employees to obtain some kind of fair share of benefits, which... Um, and the employer is going to 
uh, obtain from granted patents whenever these granted patents would have some kind of commercial value. So, uh, in a certain way, the uh, Industrial Property Act seeks to uh, instill that innovative culture even in uh, employees. And um, another contribution of um, the Industrial Property Act would be that it is going to allow for the registration and protection of utility models and um, also allow for the reg registration and protection of layout designs models of integrated circuit. And, of course, it is very instrumental in that it is going to allow the registration and protection of new plant varieties and the registration and protection of geographical indications. Um, the Act is also going to allow Mauritius to accede to different treaties, namely to the Patent Cooperation Treaty. Of course, Mauritius, um, if, even uh, at this stage, even if ha it even if it has not yet acceded to the Patent Cooperation Treaty, it does work in, uh, in collaboration with uh, the different um, bodies set up by the Patent Cooperation Treaty. It does have that aspect of international, um, international cooperation. Okay, Then uh, it also... Um, will guarantee that Mauritius is going to accede to the Madrid Protocol for um, trademarks. And this is something which is quite novel in our uh, judicial system. And uh, also the accession to the Hague Agreement for um, industrial designs. Now, this uh, accession to the Madrid Protocol for Trademarks also allows the, um, for example, the owners of um, famous trademarks to enforce their rights in Mauritius, which was previously not the case, because prior to the Industrial Property Act, they had to register their uh, trademark in Mauritius for the trademark to uh, be able to be protected. But uh, with the advent of the Industrial Property Act, even uh, those uh, famous trademarks would have some kind of protection in Mauritius. So um, we are now going to have a look at the um, institutional framework, okay, which is going to be protected uh, by, uh, which is going to be catered for by the Industrial Property Act. So the Industrial Property Act, as I was telling you, is going to be the act which is going to cater, for example, for the registration of trademarks. And uh, the registration for trademarks in Mauritius is very much in line with um, all um, the criteria which would be needed, for example, in uh, other jurisdictions. For example, there are very clear cut um, indications on the registrability of trademarks. That is, the uh, trade, the Industrial Property Act really um, sets down the very principles for the absolute and the relative grounds of refusal for a trademark. And uh, there have been many cases whereby there are certain trademarks, for example, which have been refused uh, on on uh, on these uh, uh, on these uh, principles. So uh, the institutional framework, therefore, which is going to uh, protect um, those industrial um, property rights in Mauritius, would be, for example, the industry intellectual property council. Right now, okay, if, for example, someone wants to uh, register a trademark, that person prior to the Industrial Property Act simply had to go to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Regional Integration in International Trade, and there was an office over there, which was the Intellectual Industrial Property Office, and it was headed by a controller. So it was the controller of the Industrial Property Office together with his staff who would in a certain way, uh, tell the person whether the proposed trademark fulfilled the conditions for the granting of a trademark or not. 
if ever this was refused, then the person could go to the industrial property tribunal in order to challenge the decision of the industrial property office. If ever the person was still dissatisfied, then the person would go to the Supreme Court. But now this has changed, okay, because uh, right now, uh, in the first instant, there is the um, Intellectual Property Council. So its uh, object is to bring together the various institutions dealing with IP for a more coordinated and coherent approach and to seek and provide guidance in the design and implementation of IP policies. For instance, um, before the uh, IP 2019, um, it was the Ministry of Arts and Culture which was responsible for the registration of copyright. So there was quite a demarcation between copyright on the one hand and um, the industrial property rights. Many people, even when I was conducting my lectures and I used to ask my students, well, do you know which ministry is going to be responsible for the granting of a trademark? Many, uh, most of the students, law students were clueless about which ministry it was and they were quite surprised to learn that it was the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So this is one lacune which the uh, IP 2019 is seeking to do without. That is to reinforce uh, that IP awareness in uh, the public, and this is being done right now. This has the work has started uh, before, and it is a continuing process. So, um, for example, the Intellectual Property Council is going to have a coordination purpose in respect to the formulation and enforcement of IP policies, and it is also going to advise the minister, okay, on intellectual property matters. So the council is going to be some kind of independent institution. It's going to comprise of representatives from the ministry, the private sector, the customs department of the Mauritius Revenue Authority, which is a very important uh, actor in uh, protecting uh, intellectual property rights and also the anti-piracy unit of the police. So when there would be those uh, reunion of representatives from all those different sectors, this is going to guarantee a more harmonized and global approach to advising the minister. Then um, we come to the Intellectual Property Office of Mauritius. This is going to be a department within the ministry and the ministry here is uh, still going to be the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs interna uh, and International Integration. And um, the uh, mandate of the Industrial Property Office would be to investigate claims of any intellectual property related offence under both the Act and the Protection Against Unfair Practices Act. Okay, so um, the one, the person, the director of um, the intellectual property office is going to have the responsibility of controlling, operating, and managing the operations of the office on a day-to-day -day um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Moreover. Um, the director is also going to have additional duties, such as uh, maintaining uh, up-to-date databases, undertaking, assisting, researching on industrial property, um, devising and assisting in the preparation of educational and sensitization uh, programs, and also implementing strategies and action plans in line with uh, regional and international best practices best practices, and also um, developing some kind of uh, links with international agencies, which would be dealing with uh, intellectual property matters. Then um, we have the Industrial Property Tribunal. So the Industrial Property Tribunal 
already existed, but its role has been reinforced by the IPA 2019. Um, basically, it is a tribunal which operates as a court, which is going to deal with appeals from decisions of the Industrial Property Office, okay, and uh, as well as applications for invalidation from a person residing in Mauritius or one who does not reside or carry on business in Mauritius. Um, there is a recent judgment on uh, Shangri-La Tours and Shangri-La International Hotel Management Limited. And therefore, where Shangri-La uh, is some kind of multinational brand, okay, and uh, whereby the applicant applied for the cancellation of the trademark registration for the word Shangri-La, and it was granted. So usually uh, the jurisdiction of the tribunal is that it is going to hear and to determine appeal by person who feel agreed by the rejection of an application um, by the director. And uh, moreover, that industrial property tribunal is also going to be instrumental uh, in the uh, granting of patents because any person can apply, any interested person can apply to the tribunal to invalidate the grant of a patent or the protection of a plant variety or even the registration of a utility model, a layout design, an industrial design, a mock or a geographical indication. So, um, this um, tribunal is going to reinforce the enforcement of intellectual property law by making sure that the provisions of the Act are properly um, implemented and uh, making changes, uh, for example, when it is not uh, being, when the law is not being respected by amending or cancelling the decisions of the director, which can cause a person to be Approved. Now, the Supreme Court, of course, if ever someone is not happy about the decision of the Industrial Property Tribunal, that person can go to the Supreme Court, okay, because the Supreme Court, of course, is going to seek, uh, is going to grant redress if ever the Supreme Court believes that the Industrial Property Tribunal has not applied the provisions of the related law properly. Um, Usually, um, you have um, the Supreme uh, Law. Just recently, there was the case of the British American uh, Tobacco and uh, the controller of the Industrial Property Office, which is quite illustrative of that matter. Because uh, there was a dispute <clears throat> on uh, the trademark super much and that uh, the trademark, uh, the main contention was that a super match was not registered at all in Mauritius. So one of the issues was that the controller had not considered whether the claim of earlier filing of the applicant regarding its opposition to the registration was visible. And it, made no specific and direct findings on this question. And therefore, uh, the, um, um, uh, the court disagreed to the findings of the tribunal, allowed the appeal. Now, um, so the Supreme Court, in the granting of uh, a, uh, an industrial uh, property right, is quite instrumental in that it can reverse a decision which has been taken by the Industrial Property Tribunal or the Intellectual um, Property Office. Of course, the, in, the Supreme Court also has a very important role to play in the enforcement of trademarks because the majority of cases pertaining to trademark infringement to patent infringement, till now we do not have any cases as such on trademark infringement, but um, if ever there would be any such cases, these cases would um, therefore lie with uh, the Supreme Court. Okay, then uh, we also have um, a very important um, uh, enforcement uh, mechanism <coughs> 
in uh, the um, <coughs> customs um, department. Okay, so in Mauritius, there is the Mauritius Revenue Authority and it uh, exercises uh, powers to the custom department and uh, usually the customs department enforces quite restrictive measures relating to IPOs. Okay, so um, this is once more in line with the TRIPS agreement, which acknowledges the importance of effective border control procedures and the role of the customs. So um, in Mauritius, we have the Customs Act of 1988, which empowers custom authorities to take specific measures for enforcing um, trademarks at the border. So the customs department has, in asserting with the responsibility for safeguarding the Mauritian borders against um, infringing goods by controlling the entry and exit of those goods. And border measures in Mauritius constitute an effective way because it enables Mauritius to have some kind of clean image with regard to IPO goods as the customs will be able to act on infringing goods at the source. And it also um, encourages multinationals and other highly branded trademarks to um, in invest in Mauritius. So usually what happens is that once the rights owners have a validly registered trade mark at the industrial property office, they can apply for customs border protection and a suspe suspension of clearance of goods. Um, and then usually um, the customs border protection is fairly simple, reasonably priced and also highly effective. Um, usually if ever um, there is uh, um, uh, some kind of doubt about um, the, um, the uh, genuine nature of some goods <coughs> entering the island, okay, um, the um, applicant is going to be notified in writing of this decision. And then um, the customs uh, border protection usually is valid for a period of two years, as from um, the date the right holder is notified of the director's general approval. So as soon as suspected um, unauthorized imports are detected, the customs department is going to send a notification to the rights holder or their representatives and would give them 10 days to take appropriate action. So during this time, they can carry out an inspection of the products and take photos of the detained consignments. Now, if ever uh, the imports are not authorized, then the rights holders can in most cases reach an agreement with the infringer so that the products can be re-exported back to source or in the alternative, the right holder can proceed with a court action to seek forfeiture of the products and reimburse reimbursement of the costs which are incurred. Now, it is worth noting that if rights holders do not initiate legal proceedings against the infringer as regards the detained consignment, the customs will automatically release the products to the importer past the deadline, and this irrespective of the fact whether um, the goods are genuine or uh, whether the goods are uh, simply counterfeit uh, products. Okay, So um, this would be in a certain way, what I have been exposing to you would be in a certain way the positive aspects of how uh, the IPA, how our industrial property laws can enforce, can be helpful in enforcing the rights of um, intellectual property rights owners. However, there are many shortcomings as well in um, the enforcement um, mechanism. Because um, since there are several um, institutions which are interested entrusted with IP policy formulation, administration of IP laws and managing rights of IP owners. Okay, this is a very strong point in Mauritius, but um, we have also seen that in some cases, those institutions tend to be weak mm -hmm. and strong um, initiatives are not the, always taken. 
and um, the ineffectiveness of enforcement mechanisms is mostly associated to poor training, inadequate resources, or lack of expertise amongst um, the relevant officials. There is also a blatant lack of awareness sometimes from right hold, uh, holders and the general public. And uh, sometimes there is also uh, a weak coordination between those different agencies, including sometimes a lack of transparencies. So um, IP issues sometimes can be um, complicated and require technical knowledge, understanding and skill. But there is no such training program which is organized to enable judges, public prosecutors, customs and police officers to study IP and to equip them with the general um, skill and knowledge so that they can be able to effectively discharge their responsibilities. And uh, sometimes the intellectual property awareness and knowledge of members of um, the enforcement agencies can be quite low. The same as well um, can be said um, to uh, concerning the customs department because um, customs, uh, the officers are empowered to prevent uh, infringement of conferred rights. But the effectiveness of this approach is going to depend on good cooperation and communication between the customs authorities and the rights owners. And this cooperation is a sine qua non condition for combating counterfeiting. But uh, we noticed that in Mauritius, that despite all those laws which are being imposed, counterfeited goods continue to be sold. Hence, it is clear that counterfeit goods do enter our local market and uh, that there is some kind of uh, lacune or drawback in that there is not enough protection uh, concerning uh, border protection. Um, another uh, <clears throat> Um, uh, disadvantage concerning our enforcement policies uh, and other disadvantage limitations concerning uh, our protection would be that there are de minimis uh, imports. And now those de minimis imports have to be reassessed because it can cause substantial harm to the registered trademark owner. In such cases, practices are recurrent, the, the rights holder can be prejudiced because a, num a frequent number of imports of small quantities can also favor an over-exploitation of this right. Okay, Many people may import small quantities and this can lead to significant number of imports. So uh, this should also uh, be addressed to. These aspects have to be addressed to. And uh, also, um, when it comes to civil uh, proceedings, very often uh, what happens is that okay. and uh, another um, problem is that when it comes to civil proceedings, very often when uh, the plaintiff or the one whose Hello. rights are being yeah. Well, the one whose rights are being prejudiced is going to assess um, in a certain way um, the likelihood uh, of his action succeeding and how much he's going to obtain as a result of uh, an action which is going to be initiated in court. Um, sometimes um, this assessment of uh, uh, this of uh, the cost which can be incurred and the relief which is is going to be obtained afterwards, very often it discourages the intellectual property rights owners from um, really um, entering an action in court. Okay, so um, I have tried um, in a brief manner, as uh, briefly as possible, to try to expose to you um, the main um, intellectual property rights which are protected in Mauritius and also what are the main um, enforcement um, mechanisms concerning those rights. I hope that this has been clear. So if ever you have any questions, you're most welcome. Um, Madam, uh, good evening. I just heard your speech. 
And I have a question, especially uh, as you are talking about this trademark protection uh, in Mauritius. So, um, uh, do you our uh, office means like IP office in Mauritius? Uh, do they follow uh, the search procedure? Uh, I mean, what are the methods you follow? Do you have that VNS search and you have the sound mark search? What kind of the, what are the different types of the searches are available with your IP office for the trademark? Um, it's like, it's, yeah, trademark things. Okay, I know that they uh, make use of the NIS classification whenever they have to uh, give uh, protection to a trademark, then uh, they use the NIS classification system. But um, I didn't get uh, um, the question. Well. No, the, I'm talking about the search. Suppose I uh, want to file a trademark and yes. before filing, I want mm -hmm. to be sure or uh, even Whenever I'm going to uh, when I create a trademark for my business, mm -hmm. my first duty is to find out whether the similar kind of the trademark is pre-existing with the system of that particular country. So mm -hmm. what are the methods are available with your trademark office so that mm -hmm. one can conduct the search by themselves? Is it ever like in India, if you go for the IP? Yes, yes. They, they do have um, a complete database of all the trademarks which are registered in Mauritius. They do have it. It is on the website of the Industrial Property Office. So if ever you want, and they have the different classifications as well for uh, the trademark and for which classifications it is going to be um, protected. Because... Um, in a certain way, the protection in Mauritius is that if ever you have a similar trademark, but uh, if you're going to use it for, uh, for example, something which is radically different from the protection uh, which is going to be given to it, in certain cases, it can even be allowed, as long as uh, the trademark is not really a notorious one or one which is extremely well known. Okay. How long it takes to register a trademark in Mauritius? from the day of, uh, of filing the application? Um, this depends. If uh, there is no, uh, no major hurdle, then it can take up to 30, 30 days or even less. <clears throat> so you have no provisions for advertisement of the trademark in a trademark journal? No, no we don't have that. Okay, so there is no provisions of this filing the trademark opposition then? Um, this, um, no, but then, um, I think they do, uh, they do it, they do it, but, uh, it is not, uh, advertised as such in, um, in, in a journal. I mean, if ever they are going to see when they are going to, uh, do their, uh, trademark search that there is something which is similar, they can even ask uh, the authorization of that, uh, trademark owner if he or she is agreeable to that. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, sir. Uh, we might take one or two more questions from Mrs. Zor. Dear participants. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Ma'am, uh, myself, uh, myself, Hoi Montika Chakraborty. I am from a uh, student of Naoto University. Ma'am, it was really very good uh, seeing your presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Ma'am, there is one general question I which I uh, would like to put forward. Ma'am, uh, does English uh, does uh, common law apply in uh, Mauritius? Yes, yes, it does. It does. But everything is uh, in a certain way. We have everything is in statute for. So. Um, Common law will be applied if ever there is some kind of judicial void or uh, if ever we need to interpret a relevant section of the law. Then we are going to go towards the common law. But it does apply. It does apply, but in a subsidiary manner. We have a hierarchy of norms, uh, a hierarchy of laws. The first one is the constitution. Then we have the different legislations. And uh, then we have the common law if ever there is a situation which has not been catered for. Thank um, you so much. Is... 
My pleasure. Thank you so very much. We might take one last question. Dear participants, we might take one last question for the day for our esteemed speaker of the day. So I guess we can conclude for the session today. I request Dr. Rakesh Kumar Singh for his concluding remarks. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, really, ma'am, it was uh, a very compact and uh, uh, very uh, informative presentation. And I am very much uh, uh, basically on behalf of Penelope University School of Legal Studies and Patent Promotion and IP Cell. We are very much thankful to you for sparing your valuable time. And uh, uh, so far as uh, providing us the informations, and uh, I tell from my personal aspect as a student of law, I am very much keen to learn about different legal systems. So as you have started uh, with your with your uh, your presentation with the legal system as what is prevailing in Mauritius, uh, I am learning different legal systems of the world, but it was not known to me about what the legal system uh, is prevailing in Mauritius. So thank you very much. Apart from uh, so far as the informative and uh, very thought provoking aspects you have said about the whole Mauritian uh, intellectual property in Mauritian uh, con uh, context. I feel that it, it uh, so far as it has equipped our learners and participants right, and they have learned a lot about the IP, uh, the way how it is prevailing in Mauritius. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you for having given me the opportunity to share um, the, the Mauritian experience with you. And it's true that uh, from a comparative law uh, perspective, our legal system is quite interesting to uh, to read uh, and to uh, to try to learn things from. I thank you for this privilege. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ms. Lubish Kasis Orbintu, for attending this session. I thank you on behalf of the New Delhi University, the organizing committee, and on my own behalf. Thank you, madam. And uh, dear participants, we have reached the closing session of day three of this faculty international refresher course. So we shall meet again for day four tomorrow, six o'clock sharp, Indian Standard Time. Thank you and good night to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Ma'am, uh, myself, uh, myself, Hoi Montika Chakraborty. I am from a uh, student of Naote University. Ma'am, it was really very good uh, seeing your presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Ma'am, there is one general question I which I uh, would like to put forward. Ma'am, uh, does, Engl uh, does uh, common law apply in uh, Mauritius? Yes, yes, it does. It does. But everything is uh, in a certain way. We have everything is in statute for. So um, common law will be applied if ever there is some kind of judicial void or uh, if ever we need to interpret a relevant section.